Is there anybody out? You know where they, I think there's a couple more like they're coming back. Yeah. Well, never mind. <laughs> All right. Let's deal with the anaerobes and pseudomonas. Okay. Now, you know, sometimes I do things for good reasons. Sometimes we do things just because there's no other else to put an organism. This is one of these cases, basically. Okay. Um, okay. Anaerobes and pseudomonas. Okay. Um, now, think about this a minute. You know, think how much time we spent talking about uh, these last lectures, just you know, one or two species. Okay. We're going to cover here the whole of anaerobic bacteriology in one lecture. Okay. Think about that for a moment. There has to be a reason. Okay. I mean, how can we cover the whole of anaerobic bacteriology in one lecture? Well, the reason we're covering it is for a very good reason, is that most of the anaerobes, we don't know very much about them, and they infect together. With the exception, that's among the non-spore formers. Now, the exception, which we're going to spend quite a bit of time on, is just the anaerobic spore formers. So, I want you to understand in this lecture, one thing in particular is, you know, why are we doing this? Why are we lumping everything together? And sort of why, you know, what's the situation that's common to all these diseases? And it's also common to the anaerobic spore formers as well. But there's some different thing is, is that there's some unique features of each of the four different clostridial diseases that I'm going to talk about today. Okay? So, um, let's think, of, now in addition to that, we're covering pseudomonas, which is another opportunist. These are all really opportunists. Um, pseudomonas is a strict aerobe. So, don't confuse the pseudomonas with everything else we're talking about today, just because we happen to cover it today. Pseudomonas is a gram-negative rod. It's a strict aerobe. Okay, so 90% of what we're going to be talking about today refers to the strict anaerobes, which is everything else we're covering. Okay? Okay. So, just for, I'm, I'm sorry, you, I've asked you a million times. What's your name again? Yeah, yeah it's uh, Nemo. I keep, th I keep, I need, I keep thinking of you know, that uh, thing about the ship. Yeah, you know, sort of Captain Nemo. <laughs> okay, that's probably a good way to remember it. Okay, all right, so we, we covered these, the, the strict anaerobes, which makes up you know, this vast group of organisms. We're going to be a lot of focus on the clostridia, and then pseudomonas were signaling out as the strict aerobe. So that's the plan of attack. We're going to have a general discussion about obligate anaerobes, much of which will apply to the clostridia. But we're going to have lots to say because there are four different organisms. We're particularly talking about clostridium tetani, clostridium perfringens. Clostridium botulinum and Clostridium difficile. And then we cover this strict aerobe, which has got nothing to do with anything that we discussed before, except that it is also an opportunist. And that's why, one of the reasons we shoved it in here. Okay, obligate strict anaerobes. We've discussed this earlier on when we talked about the Krebs cycle and what have you. So I'm not going to go through all that again. Um, what, I will say, what I will say is that there's no oxidative phosphorylation as we've already said, which is typical of an obligate anaerobe. We know that fermentation occurs. We've discussed all this. We know that they're killed by oxygen. And we know that they lack certain enzymes, superoxide, dismutase, catalase, peroxidase, that are involved in getting rid of uh, free radicals and hydrogen peroxide, which are produced as, 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 as um, side reaction products of metabolism. Okay, so they lack these enzymes. That's regular, other bacteria make one or more of these different types of enzymes and are very good at getting rid of these toxic byproducts of metabolism, but the obligate or strict anaerobes can't. Okay, so they're different. Now, the only time I've ever seen this word polymicrobic is when it relates to a strictly anaerobic infection. These are polymicrobic anaerobic infections because the human flora has many species of strict anaerobes, particularly in, in the uh, gut, in the, in the intestine, because of the, the low oxygen content, but not just in the gut. Your common sense would tell you that there shouldn't be strict anaerobes in the respiratory tract, they shouldn't be on the skin, they shouldn't be in soil. Well, nature's unfortunately decided that uh, it's smarter than we are. You do find strict anaerobes on the skin, you do find them in the respiratory tract, you do find them in the environment. And presumably, and I don't think anybody could give you a straight answer, but I'll try and give you what I think is what's going on, 
is that presumably these organisms grow in micro-colonies wherever they're growing, along with some facultative aerobes and, and strict aerobes. And these other organisms are cleaning up the vicinity so that the strict anaerobes can grow. So they might, for example, they might grow, uh, let's say, where there's been some um, uh, near a sweat gland or in a sweat gland, or they might grow um, in a, um, a spacious secretion. But whatever, the, the, the take-home message is you do find strict anaerobes um, and you do find even systemic infections in the hospital with strict anaerobes. So common sense is wrong in this case. Okay, these, the opportunistic growth, particularly that happens though in injured tissues. Somebody might have diabetes and they've got some nasty lesion there for resulting from that. It might be on a, um, in a battlefield where somebody's got a, a wound from a bullet or from a bomb. Stick anywhere where the tissue has been destroyed is where these organisms are going to tend to grow. They don't grow in healthy tissues generally. Now, of course, once you've got a massive amount of these organisms there, they will grow because they're going to change the, they're going to use up all the oxygen, so they keep on going. So I'm talking about in the inciting event when things are getting going. There's a few organisms in a wound. They're not going to, they're not going to grow. And this is why the word polymicrobic is such a big deal. Because what seems to happen is, is that there's a simultaneous infection with a facultative anaerobe, usually, because there aren't that many uh, strict aerobes around. Most of, most of organisms of medical importance are facultative anaerobes. But anyway, it could, be a, it could also be a, a, um, uh, an obligate aerobe. But these other bacteria growing in this polymicrobic infection, along with the strict anaerobes, presumably change the oxygen concentration in this damaged area. The blood supply is already uh, diminished because of the damage possibly the blood vessels. And this aids in the growth of these obligate anaerobes. So the polymicrobic refers to the fact, not just that there's a fact there's a mixture of facultative anaerobes and obligate anaerobes, but also the fact there can be many different anaerobic species. There could just be a few, a few in some cases. But the point is, anything's basically up for grabs in this situation. And that's, why, and that's why we, as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, that's why we can cover all these strict anaerobes in one lecture. Okay? Because... This, is, this situation applies to any of them, and it does apply to the clostridia that I'm going to single out and talk about separately also. Okay? And we should talk about the other, and again, we don't usually use this word except when it relates, these words except when it relates to the strict anaerobes. We talk about endogenous versus exogenous infection. Why do we use these terms? Because I've already said you can find strict anaerobes in the normal flora. Particularly, they'll be in, fe in, in fecal matter. There's a lot of anaerobes in, in the intestine. There's a lot of it in fecal matter. That's endogenous. Now, again, common sense would tell you that you, should find, you shouldn't find strict anaer anaerobes growing in the environment. Well, the, main, or the most common anaerobe that you'll isolate in the environment will be the psyllii, which are aerobic. But you do find strict anaerobes in the environment, in soil. And, and I've given you the explanation just now why that could happen. That's referred to as an exogenous infection. Okay, so it's going to be endogenous, coming from fecal matter. It could be from contamination with soil. And if somebody, for example, is in a battlefield and they've been, they've been hit by a bomb and they're laying on the ground in a bunch of mud or dirt, obviously it could come from either an exogenous or an endogenous way and nobody would have a clue which one it was. Okay, so this is really just to get an idea of why this is happening rather than what happens in a particular patient. Um, so sources of spore formers or non-spore formers, as I've said already, the spore formers are the clostridia. These are the major, the, most, the, the vast, they're the only organism we talk about uh, as regards to the, uh, um, clinically um, as relates to um, anaerobic spore formers, the clostridia. They make a lot of the different exotoxins, and there are, say there are four different diseases, each caused by a different, a different exotoxin is involved, or three where an exotoxin is involved. No, we'll get, we'll get there. You'll see the difference when we'll get there. But anyway, four unique list situations, let's put it that way. And they're common in the environment, which again is not what you would expect, but that they're there all right, in the soil. And they're also found in the normal flora, flora exogenous versus endogenous. The non-spore formers, there haven't really been any, any important exotoxins described. So you don't really have to worry about exotoxins when you're talking about the non-spore formers, which is another reason we can dismiss them so quickly, because there's nothing much to say. Okay, 
Where do we find anaerobes? Well, as we've said already, the intestine is the major site, but not the only site. We find them also in places like the mouth or the genital urinary tract, find them in places where you might not expect them. 95 to 90% of the bacterial biomass are strict anaerobes in faeces. The other ones are facultative anaerobes. And you might say to yourself, wow, you know, there's 99% of these are strict anaerobes. Well, almost all infections from the intestinal tract must be caused by strict anaerobes. And that would be totally incorrect. There are two reasons, there are two situations where it's totally incorrect. First of all, Bacteroides fragilis is much more commonly isolated than other strict anaerobes. In it, um, and it's the one that's really singled out, which is why I've singled it out. I've given you a whole bunch of names. You can look at them, make sure you recognize them. But the one you really need to remember is Bacteroides fragilis. It's a minor component of the gut flora, yet it is the most common among the strict anaerobic infections after abdominal surgery. So something's different about this one. Okay, Bacteroides fragilis, a strict anaerobe. The other thing that's different as well is that the Enterobacteriaceae, being facultative anaerobes, are commonly found, as I've already said, in the gut flora, but in low numbers. Yet, there are many, infe there are many infections by facultative anaerobes, particularly the Enterobacteriaceae in abdominal surgery, for example. Well, that should be no shock, because these suckers grow. A, strict, a, a facultative anaerobe will grow very happily once it gets into a tissue. It's going to take off like wildfire. A strict anaerobe has got to, got to be lucky and there's got to be other organisms growing along with it that create the right opportunity. That's what we mean by opportunistic infection. There's got to be an opportunity of these things. So even though these are present in low numbers, the Enterobacteriaceae um, do cause um, many of the diseases that we see in abdominal surgery in, 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 um, and the other, so the, so the, so what the take home message is from this is back to pathogenesis 101. It's not simply the numbers of an organism that are present, it's the pathogenesis factors that they have, it's their growth characteristics that come into play. And you, you know this because you've had my earlier lectures. So you'll think about the, the pathogenesis lecture relates to this, lecture, this situation. So strict anaerobic disease can occur in sites throughout the body. Muscle, cutaneous, subcutaneous, necrosis can occur in abscesses. We're particularly thinking about tissue necrosis when we think about these diseases, not just because of the consequences, because that's when these things have an opportunity, when the tissue is necrosed or destroyed, or there's an abscess where things are walled off so that the immune system and blood supply can't get at it. Okay, so we're particularly thinking about necrosis and abscess when we're thinking about strictly ana strict anaerobes and human disease. Now, bad enough that... that um, these other things, there, there are real problems in identifying anaerobic infections. First of all, when taking a sample, and I'm not here today to tell you how to take a sample on a ward, you'll get that when you're in the hospital. But if, if, you, don't do, if you do it incorrectly and you do get air in the sample, there's not going to be any growth. These organisms are killed by oxygen. So if the individual taking the sample is not trained properly, they might as well not bother to send it to the clinical lab in the first place. In addition, I've seen situations where people will put samples in a refrigerator and they wait till the next day before anything happens to them. You don't, you, know, you don't do that in this situation. These things are going to be dealt with as quickly as possible. Identification takes a lot longer than it does, which also limits in usefulness for the strict anaerobes because they grow so slowly, so poorly, because of the situation we talked about in an earlier lecture. And they're often derived from the normal flora. So that can make, not just contamination, but it can confuse the whole situation because how do you know if you've just simply got unlucky and, you know, sort of your syringe went through the skin and when you're taking a sample or you, you know, somehow you touched the thing or what have you. Um, so it's very, anaerobic bacteriology is very difficult. It's an art form. And um, it's a lot easier nowadays. There was at one point in time clinical labs just didn't do it all together. I mean, it's just so difficult they didn't even mess with it. But I think those days are over and done with. Um, because and I won't go into the details, because basically there are anaerobic hoods nowadays that you can use, and there are also little, um, little jars that you can make anaerobic very easily just by throwing a palladium catalyst in them. So strict anaerobes are a lot easier to, to deal with now than they were, let's say, 30 years ago. But uh, there's still a pain in the neck dealing with strict anaerobes, and some labs just don't, you know, you know, don't mess with these things. So laboratory identification when it's done, would be based on either biochemical kits or gas chromatography. Now, the issue is here, 
But I, in an earlier lecture, I talked about short-chain fatty acids and alcohols being produced in fermentation. And we're again talking about anaerobes. We're not talking about one species or one genus. We're talking about the whole mass of gram-negative and gram-positive rods, cocci, spirals, you name it. The whole lot is being dealt with at the same time. And what it comes down to is that you can do, you can do substrate utilisation, but and this is the one particular case where gas chromatography, um, I think it's, I think it's probably, it's, begin, it's probably stopping now, but most, perhaps 20, 30 years ago, certainly many, many clinical microbiology labs would do gas chromatography to detect the volatile fermentation product. Because by looking for a particular alcohol or particular acid or what have you, you could say what you were dealing with. So particularly we're focusing on uh, substrate utilization and the fermentation products when it comes to strict anaerobes. And you can look this list over and take a look at it, but that's the one that ought to stand out when you're going through this, Bacteroides fragilis. And we could, we could you know, make this list a hundred times longer. This is just some examples. There's no way we can cover every strict anaerobe. It's just not possible. Okay, now we singled out Bacteroides fragilis. And why did we single out? We, we always said why we singled out Bacteroides fragilis. Because it's the major disease causing strict anaerobic spore, non-spore former. But this organism has been studied a little more, not a lot. And it has a very prominent capsule which is antiphagocytic and is believed to actually be involved in the abscess formation that goes on. And just because we've got to say something about Bacteroides fragilis, since it, since it is the major one among these uh, non-spore forming strict anaerobes, the endotoxin is, being, is believed to be less toxic in this disease and the structure is a little different than other lipopolysaccharides. But the, big, the most important thing we're talking about when it, by far when we're talking about Bacteroides fragilis is this prominent capsule. And there's essentially nothing else one can say about Bacteroides fragilis. And there's really no point saying anything else about the rest of them. But the issue that comes down to this is recognise why, why we get these strict anaerobic infections. They're, they are important. I don't want to, just because we don't have much to say about them, again, doesn't mean that they're unimportant. Okay? Um, that's the problem. If, you know, if there's a lot known about an organism, then you've got a lot to say about it. But that doesn't necessarily, if there's an organism that's not studied for whatever reason and there's not much to say about it, that doesn't mean it's unimportant. Strictly anaerobic infections are very common opportunistic infections in the hospital and you shouldn't dismiss them. Okay? And a good clinical microbiology lab should be able to isolate a strict anaerobe. They're, they're not going to be as successful as they would be with other organisms, and there may be difficulties in interpretation for the reasons that I've given. But uh, a good clinical microbiology lab should be able to do this. And yes, we have grown them in our lab, and yes, they can be grown. I mean, I'm quite confident about that. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, but now we're going to have a lot to say is the clostridia. Okay. And I'm going to just be talking here about the classic diseases because there are four of them here. Which, and, um, and the particular ones, we're going to, um, these, are some, these are some of the major human diseases. Three of the four are major human diseases that we're going to be talking about today. Gram positive rods, and again, every, lot, lot of, lots of strict anaerobes in the human intestine. That would be endogenous infection. Coming from the soil would be exogenous. You can, of course, imagine a situation where both are going on at the same time. Okay, we'll start with tetanus, Clostridium tetani. That is the typical thing you see in a patient with tetanus. Okay, this person cannot move. As it's shown, the muscle, back and legs are rigid. There are muscle spasms that are so severe it can even break bones. And it can be fatal, particularly from respiratory failure. That is why every one of you in this room has been immunized. You had as a child, you had DPT, which would immunize you against diphtheria, pertussis and tetanus. This used to be a major problem. It's why uh, still sometimes you'll go to a, a, a physician's office or a hospital and they'll say to you, do you know if you've been immunized against tetanus? And why they'll give you a tetanus shot. Because this is one of the, this is a, this is one of the major life-threatening diseases. Now, we should, we've all been, should have all been vaccinated as children. Um, we should have good immunity. And so then there's very few cases of tetanus in this country. But that doesn't make it unimportant. It means that if you, um, that if the people were not vaccinated, it would come back in a heartbeat because these organisms are growing in the, in the, uh, in the normal intestine and are found in the soil. Okay? So that's where, why we have a vaccine. And yes, it works. 
Okay? All right, so that's tetanus. And these organisms are referred to as drumstick. You'll see for tips, you can see for example it's thin and, and fatter here. That's where the spore would be forming. And that's a typical appearance of Clostridium tetani. Now if you were dealing with a spore forming organism, you would go, you would go further than that and I'm not going to um, make it, it's beyond the scope of this course. But yeah, there are simple things that you can do. There are special stains, a malachite green stain and there's also face contrast microscopy can be used. You can actually see these spores pretty easily. And we do this all the time with our work with anthrax. So it's not really a big deal, but I'm not, the, the, the issue is, is that that's generally what these things would look like, and that would be the, presumably the, where the spore is. Clostridium tetani is non-invasive. Okay, I'm going to contrast tetanus, botulism, and gas gangrene as we go along, and they're quite different, each one of them, in one way or another. Okay? Now, in the case of tetanus, we're talking about a non-invasive organism, but the toxin disseminates, okay? You have to differentiate when you're talking about whether the organism invades or whether the toxin invades. You do get, systemically, the, the toxin, which is referred to as tetanospasmin. Yes, it disseminates systemically, and it binds to receptors, particularly inhibitory neurons, neurons in the central nervous system, often where glycine is a neurotransmitter and it stops nerve impulses to muscles. That's why there's paralysis. The muscles are just not working, which is totally different to the flaccid paralysis that I'm going to talk about in botulism. Okay, so the toxin invading is going to be in contrast to gas gangrene where the, where the organism invades, okay, and the the neurological features that you see are going to be the opposite in tetanus and botulism, one being a rigid paralysis where there's, where there's inhibition of impulses and the other one a flaccid paralysis. Okay. Vaccination. Now, I don't, I don't think I'm... This is something we need to remember. This, that, this is done at the same time. Tetanus, pertussis and diphtheria. And the immunization is against the toxin. Now, I've said in other situations the disease might have multiple pathogenesis factors. There could be different pathogenesis factors in different subsets or strains within a species. What we're talking about tetanus, what we think about immediately is toxin, toxin, toxin. Okay? And there's a good vaccine, again, which is a tetanus toxoid, and you've all, you should have all been immunized to get with it. And that's why we don't see tetanus in this country. Now, I don't remember about tetanus, but I do remember about diphtheria, which is a similar situation, and when, when the Russian Revolution, the second Russian Revolution occurred, the health system broke down in the country, and you all know that wasn't long, that wasn't long ago, about 20 years ago, and there was a sudden and dramatic increase, increase of case, cases of diphtheria in Russia. And I wouldn't be at all surprised, I don't remember, to look that one up at the time, but I'd be pretty sure that tetanus went along with it. So basically, you know, these, this, we don't see the disease, and it's not because the disease is unimportant, we don't see the disease because it is important, and health measures have been taken to make sure you don't get tetanus. Okay? So I think what I'm, what I'm basically saying is you shouldn't really, and think about the situation in, in uh, Louisiana. You know, I mean, that should have been a situation sorted out in a couple of days. Let's imagine what happened over that period of a year. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't... I mean, I, hopefully, I, I think things did get sorted out over a period of weeks, but imagine if something like that happened. You could very easily see tetanus, diphtheria, and all these sorts of things happening where the organism resides in the normal flora, and the only thing holding it back is the vaccine. And if you don't continue to do this sort of thing, you could very easily see a rise in these sorts of things. Assuming in the future the country will be less chaotic in dealing with this sort of thing. Okay, Clostridium perfringens. Now here we say again, soil and or fecal contamination, endogenous or exogenous contamination. And you particularly think about war when you're thinking about gas, about clostridium perfringens. Those of you who've watched old movies or still see movies about old times will, will see them, these, these situations where you see people where they're having their legs amputated and they take a red hot iron and seal the wound. You, you won't, don't worry, you won't be doing that. <laughs> but that's, that was, that was, that's what you're talking about. You see these pictures. That's gas gangrene. Okay, 
Um, it's called gas gangrene because the organism, again, is a fermenter and produces gas, which I think is hydrogen in this case, but it doesn't matter. The issue is, is that the gas produced and we see swelling of the tissues and we see um, hydrogen and also carbon dioxide as fermentation products. The issue is that wounds get contaminated and it, you can see it in a civilian population because there's no vaccine against Clostridium perfringens. And there's no reason to have a vaccine because clinical treatment is very good nowadays. The American Army has done a fantastic job and there are very few cases of, of uh, gas gangrene or myonecrosis in this situation. Um, but the issue is, is what happens is, again, is this is where you have a, particularly a wound where there's a, an opportunity for necrosis and tissue damage, an opportunity for these organisms to take off and grow. And the actual growth part of it is no different if you're talking about the Clostridia as the anaerobic spore formers, or if you're talking about the rest of them, which are non-spore formers. The difference is when we talk about the clostridia, we're talking about something different, something extra, usually a toxin we're talking about. Now let's talk about the toxins in this case. Tissue degrading enzymes, there's, there, there are, who knows which is the most important, they're all mentioned. Lecithinase is the particular one, I suppose it's emphasized, the alpha toxin, but there are also proteolytic enzymes and saccharolytic enzymes. You need to know about all of these, and these are, and these are important because they're important because the, because the tissue is destroyed. And what happens is, is that you initially, say for example, you get an infection. Let's imagine it was in your hand, say, or your foot, and the organism starts to grow in the wound. And then what happens is, as the organism starts to grow locally in that wound, it produces these toxins. The toxins will then start to degrade the tissue. As the tissue degrades, the blood supply gets cut off. As the blood supply gets cut off, there's no oxygen. The organism moves along and it moves along if untreated, and that's why you see these situations, which doesn't happen anymore, of amputations, because the idea is to try and get the organism gone before it gets far enough to become a systemic disease, which at that point you'll die. Okay? But you shouldn't just be... And I'm, the only reason I'm emphasising this is this is a situation that would have happened without treatment. Okay? But generally, treatment is pretty good, particularly, say, with the US Army. So without treatment, death usually occurs in two days. And that's why we have a vaccine. Sorry, not a vaccine. We don't, um, don't have a vaccine in this case. But, but uh, these are the types of situations if you had a vaccine where you'd want one. In this instance, the therapy is so good. Effective antibiotic therapy, debridement. The antitoxin is available, but it probably doesn't do much. And again, amputation and death is rare. Okay? So just because you've seen a lot of old movies doesn't, you know, that's, that's you know, 1850. That's not 2006. Is it 2006? Yeah. Okay. All right. Laboratory identification, the lecithinase. There's a test for lecithinase. But I don't think you'd have any doubt, really, if you thought you had a situation of gas gangrene. Okay, so that's the... Um, now, among these organisms, there are some that will cause food poisoning. And that's, a, again, food poisoning. We talked about this with the staphylococcus. Food poisoning is not an infection. Food poisoning means it's the food is poisoned, as opposed to you getting infected, okay? This, there are enterotoxin-producing strains, and they should be dis, uh, discussed separately, thought about separately from, the, from gas gangrene and myonecrosis. Okay, the third clostridium we're going to discuss. Again, we saw this sort of drumstick, this like a chicken drumstick, thin end, this fat end in this instance where the spore is growing, presumably at the end there. Botulism. Yes, it is also very rare nowadays. Does that mean we don't need to know anything about it? Absolutely not. We need to know about it. Why do we need to know about it? Because if we don't know what we're doing, it will come back in a heartbeat. Okay, because the issue is that this is, also, this is not just food poisoning. This is a fatal food poisoning. Botulism toxin is one of the most potent exotoxins on this planet. And it's used... Uh, also, in a strange situation, I'm no expert on this, uh, in cosmetic surgery, interestingly enough. Think about that one. Anyway, um, botch, bot, that's Botox we're talking about. One of the most potent poisons on the planet. Anyway, um, so bo botulism toxin, it, it, if it gets into the food, it's very simple. You're probably dead. Why don't we see this anymore? Well, we don't see it because uh, the food industry is, is quite smart nowadays, and it has been for many years. The spore germinates in the food. It particularly occurs in inadequately sterilized canned food. Before this was recognized, there were, recognized, there were lots of cases of botulism, but people at home 
generally don't recognise this, but that, 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 that um, spore-forming bacteria are not killed by boiling. Remember that. Any autoclave in the hospital, I thought it was 121 degrees centigrade. Now, people don't usually have autoclaves in their homes. And they may just boil the food. Well, that's okay if you, if you think about it and know what you're doing. But that's when you do occasionally see cases of botulism because people don't sterilise the food properly when they can it at home. You would never see it. I mean, never say never, like James Bond said, never say never. You know, but you, it's just not heard of to see, um, um, you know, when you commercially buy food, um, it's not known. Unless, for example, if, and this is why if you ever see a can and you see that it's, um, it's bent or, it's, or it's, it's been squashed in, um, that's bad news because it may at that point have got contaminated. And worse than that, these, you know, sometimes the, 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 the uh, cans will become distended and, because of the gas production and what have you. So you, that's why you don't ever um, like buy a can of food that looks like it's damaged in any way because of the possibility of botulism. But again, if you've got the weight comes out of the factory, it's in great shape. You know, if it's kept that way, there shouldn't be a problem. And where you will see it now and again is at home. And you'll probably know about it pretty quickly because for the chance you get to do anything, chances are the person will be dead. But you just don't see it. It's so rare nowadays in this country. And again, it's not an infection. It's a food poisoning. Now, as I said, I'm going to contrast what I said with tet tetanus versus botulism because they sound on the surface the same thing, but they're not. In the case of botulinum toxin as opposed to tetanus toxin, it doesn't bind to, to, to uh, receptors in the central nervous system. It binds to peripheral nerve receptors. And it inhibits these nerve uh, impulses. So we get a flaccid paralysis where there's underwork. In tetanus, there's an overwork. The muscles are, you know, just keep on going. They're overworking. They're rigid. Okay? This is a flaccid paralysis where they're underwork, where they're not doing anything. They're, you're flopping about as opposed to a total rigidity. Okay, so they don't look anything like each other. And the reason they don't look at it like each other is in both instances a neurotoxin is involved. But the, the, where the neurotoxin acts and how it acts is totally different. So when you go back, contrast the situation with botulinum toxin, the um, flaccid paralysis, versus tetanus toxin, the rigid paralysis. Okay, overwork versus underwork. And I, I, people have asked me in the past, well, how do these people die? Well, you know, when you... Uh, any death certificate is going to say heart failure. You know, this is a systemic thing, and they do infect, it does affect the respiratory tract and the, and, the, and the heart. But this is a systemic problem. The botulinum toxin gets all over the body, and it's, and it's basically causing the, the muscles in the respiratory tract to not work. It's causing the muscles of the heart not to work. So you name it, you know, you're going to, it's going to happen. Okay, so that's, and basically, I mean, I don't think anybody really has studied why, you know, what, why do people die? Well, you know, it's so bad they die, you know, but the actual specific thing, who knows? But we're particularly thinking about respiratory failure and cardiac failure with botulinum toxin. Okay, that was what we said already, is not an infection. That's food poisoning in the adult. Okay? Which now I'm stressing is totally different with the neonate. What happens is when a person is born, usually they, they're, they don't have a normal flora. Things are sterile in the, in the, uh, in the uh, womb. When a, when a baby is born, over the first few months of life, it becomes exposed to the environment and it becomes exposed to the normal flora coming from other people, such as the mother and what have you. And the normal flora develops over the first few months of life. Now, we think of the normal flora as, you know, you shouldn't think of the normal flora as just being a bad thing. It isn't. Most of the time, the normal flora is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because what happens is that the normal flora is there. And when it's there in an adult or a teenager or a, or a, you know, a couple of year old child, that normal flora binds to all the sites on the epithelium in the, in the intestine and the respiratory tract or anywhere else. And it stops pathogens having a good shot at setting up an infection. Well, that's not the case with a neonate. There's no normal flora. And so botulism, actual infection with Clostridium botulinum does occur in infants, in, in or neonates specifically, in people in you know, the first few months of life. It's uncommon 
But nowadays, it is the predominant form of botulism. Let that one sink in. You know, it's, it's a disease that, that was a major, major problem in adults, but we've taken good measures. We've got rid of the big problem, and we're now left with the little one, the neonatal botulism. So it's not that neonatal botulism, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a world situation where you didn't know what you were doing and weren't taking effective measures, the big deal would be adult botulism. But nowadays in the United States, with the sorts of things that we do in the civilized world, um, neonatal botulism is going to be the problem because we've got rid of the big problem. And the, I mean, it's harder to deal with this problem because there's so few cases of it, you're not going to vaccinate every new you know, infant. Even if you could, you probably, you, it would be too late to do anything. So competition with the normal flora is a, is a situation here, and, it, and in other situations too, it's just a very good example of it here. And similarly, wounds. When we talk about Clostridium fringens, we think about wounds. When we think about Clostridium tetani, we think about wounds. Um, wound infections with Clostridium botulinum are extremely rare, but again, it would be an infection. Okay. Botulism, botulinum toxin. Um, the only reason I bring this up is because I have an interest in this stuff and uh, oftentimes on the television in the last few years people have talked about, a, about biochemical attacks. I don't know what a biochemical attack is. It's either a bio attack or it's a chemical attack. But anyway, biochemical attack. And botulinum toxin is one of the, um, the organisms, uh, one of the things that's used. And the thing is, is that um, it's not a biological attack. It's a chemical attack because what you're actually doing is, or you would do, and, you know, the people of the army, is, you know, has been quite interested in this for many, many years. So it's not a theoretical issue here. Um, the botulinum toxin um, resembles more a chemical attack, except that it's, it's, it occurs later. You know, the chemical attack, you usually would, like the sarin gas attacks in Japan in the subway system, things happened, people were, you know, dying and sort of wheezing and not having wheezing difficulties laying on the ground in a matter of minutes. With botulinum toxin, it would happen probably a few hours or even a next, you know, 24 hours later. So it's a little bit more delayed. But again, you're not infecting here. You're not attacking here with live, live agent. You'll be attacking with, um, a terrorist would be attacking with, um, with, with the actual toxin. Treatment. Um, there is an antitoxin. Um, but you can imagine how much supply there is of antitoxin in the country if you never see the disease. Um, antibiotic therapy is, is appropriate in the case of the infections, but again, um, would, you, would you know that somebody, would you know that you had an infant who has botulism? Would you know that you had this very rare case of, of a wound infection caused by this um, thing? So it's a little difficult to really talk. You have to sort of talk almost theoretically because you don't see this, these sorts of things. Okay, this is something you do see. Uh, this is the fourth Clostridium species we're going to be talking about now, Clostridium difficile. And this is classically nothing like as important as the other three that we discussed because tetanus, botulism, and gas gangrene have been three of the major killers historically um, against men. And that's why there have been measures taken. But now and again, you know, people get interested in Clostridia and they come up with things that are not so important, and one of them is Clostridium difficile. And this is, this is something you do see. In fact, it may have, I suppose, I shouldn't really be putting it down because these other things are so rare, you probably have more chance of seeing this. Clostridium difficile is, um, goes after antibiotic use. And what happens, this again is the normal flora we're talking about. We talked about the normal flora in a neonate. Well, the normal flora does a good job in adults as well when it's there. And what happens is, is that if you use a systemic antibiotic, particularly one that's been taken orally, the intestinal normal flora may become greatly decreased. And if it does, you can get colonization with Clostridium difficile. And that's really why this, this is one of the things that really proves that this is not some, some figment of my imagination or other microbiologists or infectious disease people's imagination, because this happens. And there is a potent antitoxin secreted by this organism and it's referred to as pseudomembranous colitis. That's what it looks like. There's a there's sort of a strange pseudomembrane forms. Now, would you know it's there? Well, not unless you used an appropriate instrument and could look, you know, and did look. But when you do look, that's what, that's what you see, a pseudomembrane forms. So it's referred to as pseudomembranous colitis caused by Clostridium difficile. And you, I imagine you know, you'd be probably more, likely, probably more likely to see this, but it's also not very common. 
And it's also in a specific situation. You know, somebody's been given, for example, they might be, um, well, as I say, they, they, it's a specific situation, so, you know, it becomes pretty obvious what's going on. Somebody's been, you know, they've had, on an antibiotic and develops gastrointestinal disease. Okay, so therapy, which makes sense, is discontinuation of the initial antibiotic, for example, ampicillin, and then you would use a more specific antibiotic therapy, such as vancomycin. And again, I'm trying in this course here to only emphasize antibiotics when I think they have a particular something, something, something unique about that disease situation. I think that you'll get, I think the better place to learn about the specific antibiotics that you're going to use is, is when you're in the hospital and when you're actually treating patients, because there are so many antibiotics out there. But these are the sorts of things that you'd be considering. Maybe it wouldn't be ampicillin and vancomycin you might be talking about 20 years from now. But certainly what would, you would be talking about this situation. Okay? All right, so that's the purpose of how you treat there. Now, th to this point, then, we've discussed strict anaerobes. Strict anaerobes. We've discussed the non-spore formers in one group, and we've discussed the spore formers. And the reason we singled out the spore formers, because, because of bad luck, they happen to be ones that, that, cause, ma that cause major human diseases in the past. <coughs> and in three of the four cases, well, actually all four cases, I keep saying that, all four cases produce a potent exotoxin. Okay. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is an important organism. Um, this organism base is, a, is a typical gram-negative rod. Nothing special about it uh, in that regard. It's a strict aerobe. And the majority of the human infections are caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, what is interesting, though, is that, well, let's, we'll get there when we get there. There is something unique about this organism. First, it's, okay, it's common in the environment, particularly it loves water. But you can see it in air and soil as well. So it's a particular thing you might find in sort of contamination in, in liquid drugs like, you know, intravenous saline or what have you. And again, it, we have good measures, controls in this country, so it, it's not a, it shouldn't be a common thing through that route. Now, where you really do see pseudomonas, though, is as follows. You, you basically do not see a normal human being, a healthy human being, basically doesn't get infected with pseudomonas, pseudomonas aeruginosa. This organism is just really well done with by the immune system really quickly. A normal person will not get it. That does not mean it's unimportant. This is a very important organism in the hospital setting. Because, what, in two, at least in three different situations as examples here, the first thing you're going to think, in burn patients, okay? The burn patients, by definition, their tissue is destroyed. That's a perfect place. There's no blood supply, or very limited blood supply. That's a perfect situation for any opportunist to take off, and pseudomonas is one of them. And being a strict aerobe, remember, it's going to take off a hell of a lot faster than a strict anaerobe. So you particularly see pseudomonas aeruginosa in burn patients where destruction of blood vessels and limited phagocyte uh, access. You also see this in cancer patients for the same reason. They've been given cytotoxic drugs, which has wiped out the immune system. And it's very commonly associated also with cystic fibrosis. And there are different mechanisms in each case. Here it's the burn, here it's destruction of the immune system. In cystic fibrosis, it's, it's really alteration in the respiratory epithelium because what happens is this nasty copious secretion that you get in, uh, in cystic fibrosis and it creates a sort of an environment which is really good for the for pseudomonas. And so they take off in this really nasty sort of mess in the lungs and they can form a pneumonia in cystic fibrosis patients. So there are th three different scenarios and I'm sure there are many others, but these are just some examples of why, you, of why pseudomonas is very associated with co the compromised host and that is the big deal. You just don't see pseudomonas aeruginos almost never in a healthy person. It's not difficult to identify this organism. It grows very well. It produces a couple of different uh, coloured products. One is called pyocyanin, which is blue-green, and the other one is fluorescine, which is a green-yellow pigment. And if you look at the colonies of these organisms, they're very slightly blue. And if you grow them up in liquid and you spin down the cells, where you get a lot of it, um, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, they're sort of a, a, a white with a blue tint. Um, I don't think anybody would do this clinically, but you know, if you have the, I mean, a clinical microbiology laboratory, but if you have the desire to, they have, because the organism is not going to affect a, a healthy person anyway, they have a fruity smell, so you can sort of go over the test tube and push it towards your nose and smell, smell the thing. They have a fruity smell. Um, again, they're not difficult to diagnose, because being a, clinically, because being a, um, 
uh, strict aerobe, as I mentioned to you earlier, they're going to particularly grow in liquid at the top of the tube rather than at the bottom. There are specific biochemical reactions as well to differentiate from other um, members of the normal flora, and I don't, I don't think it's necessary to go into the specific reactions there. Pathogenesis. Well, here's a shocker. Talking about capsules again. In this case, the uh, organisms have a particularly uh, copious secretion. It's called a slime layer. And like other capsules, it's antiphagocytic. Now, I will spend more time on this with diphtheria, but we've also discussed it in the pathogenesis lecture. Remember, I told you there are four different organisms that produce ADP ribosylating enzymes. Two of them work on cell membranes, which is E. coli and Vibrio cholerae, and two of them work on the, uh, on the ribosome, one of which is um, as, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and one of which is Carinobacterium diphtheriae. So it would be useful if you, and that's, I think I summarized that in, a, in the handout I gave you at the end of the pathogenesis lecture. So you're going, to get, you're going to get it each of the four, you know, again, each of the four organisms as we discussed them. But it's useful to remember ADP ribosylation, the four different organisms, and the two different situations. Now, as typical, as you've got the idea as we've gone through this course, as typically in these situations, what happens is some major discovery is made, was made many years ago with a particular pathogen that was, we solved that problem, and then we think, oh yeah, well there's another disease where there's something like it. And this was a situation here. Dip, the, the work, diphtheria toxin many, many years ago was known to be one of these ADP ribosylating um, enzymes, that elong, uh, ADP ribosylate elongation factor 2, interfering with protein biosynthesis and killing the cells. Um, but in this case, it's much less potent. And so when you think about the primary thing that has this mechanism, what you're always thinking about is diphtheria toxin. And diphtheria is another one of these plagues, that, the things that's plagued mankind and killed millions over the, dec over the decades, but not now, unless you happen to live in Russia, but, <laughs> as I already discussed. But anyway, um, so this is nothing like as potent as uh, diphtheria toxin, and it's not even clear whether it really is a major issue in the disease, but people will, will, may well ask you about it. Certainly, this is a big deal. The capsule is, is, is uh, this very potent capsule that it produces, presumably is important in being antiphagocytic.